Hi, this is Keith Ward with Visual Studio Magazine, and joining me now is Visual Studio Live speaker, author, MSDN columnist, uh, Ted Neward. Ted, welcome. Thank you, Keith. So, what are you talking about here this week at Visual Studio Live? So, this week uh, I'm doing two sessions, both in the NoSQL space. Uh, one of them will be on uh, MongoDB, and the other one is uh, Cassandra. So talk to me then a little bit about the rise of NoSQL and why this is becoming popular for, uh, for developers. Why is this a thing? The thing, the hot thing. Well, a hot thing. A right? hot there's, no, there's, no, there's never just one hot thing, because then, <laughs> then the industry would be boring. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, quite, quite bluntly, data itself has like a shape to it. Uh, it, it's kind of hard to explain in some respects, but when you look at a relational database, right, the data is arranged essentially in a, in a, in a, tab a, a table, a tabular right. format, a square, if you will. And we set up the data to have, you know, some of these links between these squares, right, the relational algebra and all that stuff. And it turns out that a lot of data just doesn't fit that mold very neatly. So this is where we get into the problems that a lot of developers run into when they're trying to take objects and store them. You know, try, you're literally trying to take circles and pound them into squares. And this is where we get into the object relational impedance mismatch. One of the things that we've also known that's very hard to do with uh, data that's particularly hierarchical in nature is to try to pound that into tables. Um, <clears throat> and part of what's happening is developers have kind of reached a point, it seems, where they're saying, you know what, the relational database, yes, it's a great place to store data, but there's a lot of data which doesn't lend itself naturally to the relational format. So there's been this kind of growth of, I don't want to have to store it in a relational form. I want to store it in more of a document form. I want to store it more of a graph form. Uh, I want to store it in a schema-less form so I don't have to decide up front how the data is going to look and how it needs to be arranged, et cetera. On top of that, I think what we're seeing is a lot of these NoSQLs are very developer-centric, mm -hmm. and some of that, I think, is just plain old rebellion against the severe lockdown that a lot of companies like to put their relational databases under. Interesting. So, um, give me some examples of, of some of the some of the programs you build where NoSQL makes more sense than a than a typical SQL database. Well, uh, for example. Uh, data which is document centric, right? And probably the canonical example there is a blog, right? Hmm. If you look at a blog, what you've got is a series of individual blog posts. And the posts from a purely data oriented perspective, the posts have nothing to do with one another. They are completely discrete, independent, and they don't reference one another. They don't have links to one another. If there is a link, that link is in the body of the blog mm -hmm. post, mm -hmm. right? And it's a URL, and that's up to the browser to, to make that link work. Mm -hmm. But the blog does have associated data. So, for example, there may be some graphics that go with it. There may be some slides because a speaker is talking about his presentation at a given conference. There may be some binaries. Here's the latest bits of this project I'm working on. Uh, there will be comments associated with that. There's all these things that are grouped around that singular blog post, which makes you realize that the blog is a document and it has a bunch of ancillary data related to that document. That's not a particularly relational model, to put it very bluntly. Now, a lot of times we know how to put that kind of data into a relational database. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm certain there are going to be some very SQL heavy folks who are listening to this saying, oh, but, but you could still do that with SQL. You're right, I, I still could. I can put anything I want into a SQL database. That doesn't mean that the SQL database is optimized to deal with that kind of data. So you know, that's one example. The other one that I will go to is like graph-oriented data. If you want to represent a genealogy, right? So let's look at Keith and let's look at his parents and let's look at their parents. And then you start to run into situations where, oh, well, you know, grandma was married to grandpa for a while, but then grandpa died and grandma remarried. And then that, you know, her second husband actually had been previously married, but then his wife died and they had a child. And when you start getting into all of the weird intricacies of genealogy, particularly because it's not just enough to represent the fact that two people were married, but you also want to track how long they were married, the mm -hmm. beginning and ending dates of that marriage, et cetera. 
you realize that in, a, in, in, in certain kinds of data, not just the nodes are important, but also the arcs connecting the nodes. And this is what a graph database like Neo4j or Titan or some of these other ones will do is here's a node of data which has, you know, here's Keith with some interesting information. Here's Keith's wife with some interesting information. Here's the fact that they were married from this date to this date or they still are. Or, you know, you can capture information on the arc as well and then navigate. All of these things are things we could have done right. in a relational database but it would have been difficult, it would have been clunky, it would have been slow. And so, you know, what we're finally beginning to do is we're finally beginning to pull out of this mentality that says every scrap of data that I own must be stored in a relational database. Interesting. Now, how well tuned is the .NET framework? Obviously, they're, they're .NET developers mostly at this show. Um, how good is the Microsoft framework or Microsoft technologies in dealing with NoSQL type data? Well, like any other programming platform, uh, it has its strengths, it has its weaknesses. The, uh, the .NET framework, it's, it's got some types which fit very naturally into the way certain you know, data resolves, mm -hmm. the way certain data works. Um, but, you know, .NET, you know, the .NET framework is no better and no worse than, say, the Java platform for, for uh, producing, consuming, querying, finding this data. Um, for example, uh, both Mongo and another document-oriented database, CouchDB, both of them use JSON, mm -hmm. uh, JavaScript object notation, as kind of their uh, root uh, data format, mm -hmm. right? So in both cases, I'm putting JSON documents into the database and getting them back out. Because again, it's very document-oriented. Right. Um, when you get to something like, you know, Neo4j, which is a, a graph database that happens to be built in Java, you're talking about, you know, objects can, can easily represent the nodes, mm -hmm. but they don't easily, I mean, we don't have like an arc type. We don't, you know, we can't attach arbitrary data to an object reference in .NET. Mm -hmm. So there, the object model for working with a graph database has to mirror the graph, which means there's a bit of an impedance mismatch there, right? I have an object which represents the node, and then I have another object which represents the arc which, with another object representing the node, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's no better and no worse. It's not going to be flawless, but it's, it's not terrible. For developers who are so used to working with SQL data, is it is it scary? I mean, is it a big learning curve to, to move into the NoSQL world? Uh, no, but that presumes that you're willing to learn. One of, the, one of the things that we occasionally run into, you know, you go to conferences, you go consult at a company, et cetera. You run across some developers who just don't want to learn stuff, right? This is how you know the team before me built this app, and this is how the team before that built this app. So therefore, that's the only way we really need in order to build an app. And you know, that's fine as long as the apps, the kinds of apps they're trying to build, don't ever change. Then certainly, you don't have or have to you know pick up new technologies in order to do it. The problem is, unfortunately, the business world changes because the technology has changed, and so you're going to kind of have to you know adjust as you go. Um, Learning these databases, you know, learning this new style of storage is really not that hard. The thing of it is you have to be willing to let go of the old ways of doing things. And some people just seem better, better adapted to being able to do that. Um, the other thing, unfortunately, that sometimes arises is, you know, it, it's an either or in some people's minds, right? If I go off and learn MongoDB, it means I have to throw away all my SQL Server instances. No, that's not true. You know, you can certainly run both simultaneously in production and use each for its strengths. Sort of a, a poly store, right? Polyglot is multiple languages. Poly store is multiple storage systems. Um, you can easily poly store in production. Ted Neward, thanks for uh, joining us today. And if you would please, another treat for our uh, for our audience, do uh, do your dude sign off. <laughs> Abide. Pretend I'm holding a white Russian. Abide, my children.